In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, one day. All things, visible and invisible, the whole of creation shines forth in that one day. In the Father's one eternal speaking of his consubstantial, co-eternal word and wisdom. The creation of all that exists is accomplished eternally in the Father's speaking of that one word. The word who is God, God of God, light of light. In speaking forth his Son, God the Father says, let there be light, let light exist. Let us in our transcendent life create what is not ourselves, so that we might share this life of ours with what comes to be. Let us share our life so that our life that so transcends what we are creating, that it can more truly be said not to be than to be, with what we shall bring forth into being out of non-being. God's separation of the light from the darkness is nothing other than his bringing into existence what is. In the eternal day that is creation, there is evening, that is, the descent of what is out of God, and there is morning, that is, God's drawing of that same creation back to himself. And this descent and return together are one day. God separates the light from the darkness simply by being creation's source, drawing all that is out of non-existence and then illuminating it by his superabundant goodness. So in his own eternity, God makes the world, a cosmos or universe, which in its entirety, that is to say, in its hierarchies of existence and motion and life, in its variegated beauty by which in its complexity it reflects as a whole the divine life, he calls very good. And yet that cosmos allows for darkness, because a portion of this cosmos, intelligent creation, can decide that it is, or ought to be, self-sufficient. Created intelligence, in other words, can decide that what it would be without God, that is, darkness, is better than what it is with God, that is, light. And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men loved darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. And yet the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. This great liturgy upon which we are about to embark, from the lighting of the new fire through the first mass of Easter and the first vespers of Easter day, shows forth this whole cosmic drama. In the beginning God said, let there be light. And in the darkness of the holy night, that same God speaks the same word in a very particular way. This is the night in which the all-holy trinity, imaged in the triple candle, rekindled the human life of the eternal Son, symbolized by the Paschal candle. The one who is eternally God of God, light of light. His human life, extinguished by the darkness of the creatures he had created, shone forth as a spark to renew the process of our engoding. That Satan, in his envy, and we in our recalcitrance, would have destroyed. The purpose of our God had not been thwarted. The whole history of the chosen people had witnessed to this. The Red Sea had prefigured both Christ's breaking forth from his human nature's bondage to sin and death and the font whereby we come to participate in his Passover. The entry into the Promised Land had foreshown his glorious ascension to his Father's right hand and his welcoming of his saints, his holy ones, into the heavenly Jerusalem. 
That same font, the womb of the church, is this night made fruitful by Christ, the church's bridegroom. This night, the catechumens, the little ones of the church, are born again from above by water and the Holy Spirit. And as we speed forth to the altar to receive our life under the appearances of bread and wine, we call upon those born into this family before us, and now in the nearer presence of God, to stand with us and for us before the throne of glory, as the light of light descendeth from the realms of endless day. And there in the darkness of this night, in the darkness of our lives, we come in and with Mary Magdalene, we come in and with Mary Magdalene unto the sepulchre. In and with her, we come seeking the one whom our soul loveth. In and with her, our actions have a deeper significance than we can understand. The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early when it was yet dark. In the beginning, on the first day of the first week, God created heaven and earth, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. Both the physical darkness in which Mary comes to the tomb and our own spiritual darkness, of which Lent has just reminded us all too well, point us to the cosmic darkness that would have been creation had not God in the very moment of creation called his creation back to himself. And God said, let there be light. And God divided the light from the darkness. God is light. St. John tells us in his first epistle, the same John who tells us of Mary's arrival at the tomb. God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. God is light, and he creates us to share the light that is himself. He creates our minds so that he may shine upon them, to give us the knowledge of himself, so that we might share his own life, so that he might fulfill all our desires, all our longings for the good, for God first saw the light, that it was good. But how do we find all this in lowly bread and wine? Well, in and with Mary Magdalene, our hearts cry out. They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulchre, and we know not where we have laid, where they have laid him. And in the actions of those to whom she cries, we see the answer. Peter and John run together, but John outruns Peter. John, whom Jesus loved, John, who had known that love, who had recognized and accepted that love, John, who from love for Jesus reclined upon his bosom, listening to his every word, just as the eternal Son of God is himself in the bosom of the Father, loving him in their shared eternity. John, who loves. Love outruns all else. We all love. We all desire to love and to be loved. And when we have loved, and even more so when we have been loved, our love outruns everything else, drawing us to the beloved with all our being. And yet love on its own is never enough. Love without knowledge is scattered and dispersed. And love on its own will love indiscriminately, will love every beautiful object one after another without ever finding rest. And so Peter catches up to John. Peter, who was the first to confess Jesus as the Christ. Thou art the Christ, he said at Caesarea Philippi, the son of the living God. Peter, upon the rock of whose faith our Lord founded his church. Love on its own cannot enter into true life, for love it on its own so easily loses its direction. It cannot enter the empty tomb, because all it sees is emptiness. Faith sees in the apparent emptiness a dim half-light, not yet complete sight, but the glimmer of more than darkness, and faith hopes for more light. And in that moment of hope, Love, given its true direction, revives and enters the tomb. Love, enlightened by the light of faith, can enter the tomb. 
the seeming emptiness of our lives, the stillborn ambitions of our past, in the realization that what God once created is being recreated, that the one who is light and who created us in light is drawing us back to the light. And as faith believes and hope spreads out this vista of true life, love seeks to know more, that it might love more. And as we seek to know and love more fully the one who is our life, our lives are changed. We are transformed. We come, as St. Paul says in our epistle, to set our minds on things above, not on earthly things. We put off the old man, the man who died in Adam, and put on the new man, the man recreated in the eternal light, who is Christ Jesus, the man who in us is being refashioned unto knowledge in accordance with the image of its creator. And that image that image of our Creator, is none other than our Lord Himself, our Creator, Redeemer, the eternal Word and Wisdom of God, who is always wise and never foolish, who is, as Holy Church confesses, essential light from essential light. Christ is risen, we will cry. The one who has died and risen again is at work in each one of us, still doing the work of his resurrection. He is filling the empty tomb of my life and your life with his life. He is shedding light upon the half-light of our minds. He is reshaping us as images of himself, the true image of God, so that we might share in eternity in his own life, the life that he shares with his Father and their co-eternal spirit. That is to say, nothing less than the very life of God. All this we shall see in this night.